Thank you, um, and thank you everyone for persevering this far, um, and thank you Dominic for organising. Um, so I'm Alex Hall, um, I work at the University of Birmingham, um, so, and I um, am a historian of science and an environmental historian. Um, for the last three years or so, I've been working on a project, on a large multidisciplinary project called Science and Religion Exploring the Spectrum. Um, I'm not really going to be talking much about that today, unfortunately, uh, given the time restraints. But the work on that, thinking about the list of terms that Dominic put out for us this morning, um, the work on that, I've been looking at how evolution has been uh, communicated on the BBC in the UK. Um, so I've been doing a lot of thinking about things like genre and subgenre. I've been doing a lot of thinking about tropes and devices. I've been thinking a lot about media frames and the way that's been communicated. And so from that work, um, I've been sort of thinking about some older threads of research that I'd done prior to that project and what at first seemed quite disparate areas are sort of coming together in my head a little bit and especially triggered a little bit by some of the work of the Narrative Science Project making me think in, along these lines. If anyone is interested about that work, there's a nice easy way you can learn about it. I've got some comics here that uh, outline some of the research some of my colleagues have been doing on that project. But to today's talk. So... Um, I'm going to be speaking about agency and expectations in extreme weather events. Um, the title there refers to floods. I'm actually going to talk a little bit about winter weather as well. Um, so, a little bit of an overview of what I'm, I'm going to go through. Um, I'm going to start with some case studies from previous work that I've done. Um, and through these case studies, some reflections on the importance of context and complexity in attempting to use narrative and agency as analytical concepts when we're studying past floods or other extreme weather events. And then I'm going to see if zooming out from individual events to consider a, a longer time frame and scale uh, might help us in, in, in this kind of route of analysing past extreme weather. Um, and then I'd like to reflect a little bit on potential routes forward, um, both for myself in developing this line of research, but also perhaps more widely for those of us working at the interface between the history of science and the environmental humanities and literary studies. And finally, um, I'll finish by preempting the first question from the audience by reflecting a little bit on what the point of using narrative to analyse past extreme weather events might actually be. Um, and when I first heard about, about this workshop, it really excited me. As I say, it gave me the opportunity to begin connecting what up until a few months ago to me seemed quite disparate and separate compartmentalised parts of my research. Um, so um, I'm going to kind of go through some things I've done in the past and I've been sort of reimagining them and rethinking them in light of the themes of this workshop. Uh, and hopefully as we progress, some kind of coherent, semi-coherent narrative might emerge. So... Um, my PhD thesis um, was a study of how inadvertently meteorologists became public figures and ultimately what I called risk managers. Um, the end point of my PhD th the thesis was uh, uh, 1987, um, and for those of you not familiar or not from the UK, this is a, a weather forecaster, Michael Fish, uh, an employee of the meteorological office here in the UK, who in 1987 made a, a, a faux pas uh, with uh, a weather forecast um, uh, saying that there wasn't, uh, someone had rang into the BBC and there's a hurricane on the way. I can reassure you there isn't. Um, and then overnight, the UK had one of the worst storms of the century and 13 people died. Um, and so this is the kind of headline that followed. So this was what piqued my interest in this research, that this was a kind of an end point of this kind of nefarious net they. Why didn't they warn us? Who, who was this pl place that was this politicians? Was this meteorologists themselves? So I kind of looked at this development and in the context of extreme weather and naturally triggered disasters in the 20th century, I'm interested in the changing expectations in relations to the impacts and disruption caused by these events that have accompanied the improved understanding, um, forecasting and management of these events. Where for previous generations, extreme weather events may have been accepted by a community as normal for their locale and given divine providence in their causation, in the second half of the 20th century, for many citizens in Western countries, as causation became more tangible and visible through increased meteorological understanding and its wider dissemination, the casting of blame to human actors became more commonplace. As some of my previous work on extreme weather events in the UK has highlighted, although not clearly, clearly not uniform, in the last 70 years there have been substantive changes in public expectations of state support in reducing the impact of and recovering from disaster events, 
And when this su support doesn't emerge, an increase in individual, media and formal inquiry blame casting towards perceived institutional, infrastructural and political failures. In becoming public figures, as I argued in my thesis, um, what I called risk managers, meteorologists became the expert face for the risk posed by extreme weather as expectations across society increased and the agency of these events shifted from the realm of God and the natural world to human prediction and management. To paraphrase from, from the conclusion in my, of my thesis, I said, um, the meteorologists did not invent the risk, they, nor did they even redefine it, but by explicitly calculating and naming it, however, they gave the public what it really wanted, someone to blame. While the kind of analysis I did back then it, it, it is important, it only takes us so far. While it shows us that exploring agency, whether perceived or actual in a disaster situation, may help reveal how the technological and scientific management of the environment has changed our relationship with the natural world during the 20th century, it doesn't necessarily inform us about the vectors and dynamics involved in some of these shifts. If we reassess and reframe the research in my thesis in light of the current workshops, themes and aims to focus on narrative, we see the central importance of how our protagonists, the meteorologists, communicate the story of each individual event. Reframed in this way, my thesis becomes a story of how meteorologists became what the anthropologist Gary Allen Fine has called the authors of the storm. Unfortunately, as many of the case studies in my thesis attest to and in Fine's great book, um, the, this is a far too simplistic a picture, for the public understanding of these weather events is much less akin to a single authored monograph and much more like a multi-authored Hollywood blockbuster script. While meteorologists are often the protagonist in their own narration of weather systems and sometimes the ensuing disasters and coverage after the event, once these narratives pass through media intermediaries and commentators and are reinterpreted at the community level, Meteorologists cease to have any control of the narrative. They're relegated from being the narrator and the protagonist. Occasionally they end up in cases like this where they could be called the antagonist. But most commonly they become a tertiary background character, occasionally referenced for the purported rational consistency they bring. I've enjoyed trying to reimagine the research in my thesis in this vein. However, without any of the voices of afflicted communities, it remains a top-down picture, an institutional history that focuses on professional scientists navigating public spaces. Of course, this in itself was a contested and contingent process. Just ask the hydrographers who never got to present any flood warnings on television. Um, and while these public scientists narrate uh, any, and while well, how these public scientists narrate any individual storm or flood does influence community and individual understandings of extreme weather events, it is still today only one often minor reference point by which a community lives through, interprets and responds to flooding. So the limitations of this kind of approach were, were kind of laid abundantly clear when I embarked on a postdoc um, at the University of Nottingham working with the environmental historian Georgina Enfield. And I worked briefly there on a project called Snow Scenes. Um, and as, as the title here suggests, this was a, a project collecting memories about winter and snow in Cumbria, which is in the northwest of England. We used um, a kind of multi-method approach. Um, we used written submissions via postcards, uh, which we can see here. So on the left is actually um, postcards from the 1920s and 30s distributed by the climatologist Gordon Manley. And he had a network of people who gave him snow measurements throughout the winter. So we replicated the, the postcards um, and asked people to give us their memories. But we also did oral histories, uh, focus groups, workshops, all kinds of different methods of people submitting. And again, as I caveated at the beginning, not strictly about floods, but, but important, I think, in this sense of extreme weather. And so the personally narrated accounts that, that came through this project show us that how differently individuals and communities use memory and narrative to incorporate past extreme weather events into their social history of their lives and their location. So here we have a, a, a short extract uh, quote from one of the participants. This was submitted via email to the project. I was living on the shore of Ullswater in the winter of 1962-63 at the Outward Bound Centre. The A592 was closed south of the Brackenrig Hotel and meat for the school was left there. When I skied along the road to fetch it, I was unaware that I went over the top of a car. I knew on, my, on the return only because I took a different line and I saw a gleam of paint in the drift. The snow was over the hedges. When I cleared the snow, I saw there was a car in the drift unoccupied. 
My ski tracks went over the top. Ullswater froze and someone drove a small car across the lake near Pooley Bridge. Um, bringing these kind of memories from this project alongside the kind of way that meteorologists might be discussing similar events, it helps us to begin thinking about the purpose of narration and the agentive language used by different actors when speaking about the same events. One of the most interesting and unexpected things to come out of this project, um, the project focused on quite a small rural upland region relatively, uh, and one of the interesting things was, that came out of that was the uh, divergence of the regional and community memories from larger national narratives of the same winters. So we looked a lot at uh, kind of media coverage of some of these winters at the national scale and then compared them to sort of the specific idiosyncrasies that were remembered at the regional level. Um, when you reflect on the agentive language and the narrative constructs used by different commentators in extreme weather events, it quickly becomes apparent that a vast and hugely varied amount of work is being done by the dominant narratives used by different actors in individual extreme weather events. By explicitly and contextually reflecting on these narratives, it helps us to explore power dynamics and exposes the sometimes hidden, implicit frames, the socio-political context and the changing techno and techno environments in which floods in 20th century Britain took place. So, so far I've skipped around a little just trying to highlight the complexity and the individual specificity of narratives used to speak about floods, whether being specific to individual actors or individual floods, or, or indeed both. I'd like to now zoom out a little to briefly consider what narratives that attempt to explain floods over larger temporal and spatial scales may be able to bring to the table. So this is the, the second part here that I'd like to briefly reflect on. Both the scale of the event itself and its unique orientation to the society it inflicts helps to shape the narratives which emerge connected to any large scale extreme weather event. As they retreat into history, they may become inscribed in our cultural milieu simply from one single account or incident. So in this way, we might think of Daniel Defoe's account of the Great Storm in 1703, which uh, has a largely punitive narrative throughout uh, in relation to uh, the English uh, defeats against Catholics. Um, or we might think of the account from Michael Fish in 1987 and the, the narrative of the hubris of science that might be attached to that. Yet many of the smaller floods or other extreme weather events which might have caused huge amounts of disruption and devastation when they occurred, if they don't fit in within a popular dominant master narrative or explanatory point, they often just neatly smooth out into the folds and contours of history to be forgotten uh, in a similar way I think some of the discussion in John's paper kind of spoke about that were high, you know, highly controversial and catastrophic at the time and then fade away. There are areas uh, where scholars and researchers have tried to draw together flood events as part of larger studies or frameworks. Um, this would be most commonly found in disaster risk reduction studies or risk management or sometimes policy studies more generally. So I thought I'd just bring in one of those now. Um, this is a paper by Johnson et al. from 2005 um, and it shows uh, how UK flood events have been pr repeatedly provided a window for policy acceleration. Um, it shows that, they argue in this paper, that policy uh, accelerations didn't bring in new ideas, the flood events. The ideas were already circulating, but what the floods provided is the catalyst and the political attention to get the policy change enacted. Um, interestingly, if you can see this top column here, um, the nature of humans uh, thing with the belief systems on the left, we have humans have dominion over nature, humans have dominion over nature, but power and right to exercise it. And humans are part of nature, not superior to it. Nature has intrinsic value. Now, that's quite a common narrative for anyone who's thought about uh, changing techno environments or environmental history more broadly. Although the dates here are specific to flood policy, but these are this is a policy sort of focused paper, um, and so it may vary from some other kind of interpretations of that. Um, so, another another way that we might think about this um, is. This is a chapter that I wrote in 2015 as part of a collection called uh, Cultural Histories and Memories of Extreme and Extreme Weather, which was edited by Georgina Enfield and Lucy Veal. Um, and this is a great collection. A lot of varied uh, locations around the world are co considered in this. Uh, and in this chapter, I wanted to go beyond disaster histories that treat extreme weather caused disasters as non reoccurring one off catastrophic events which might briefly cause societal breakdown and then disappear. 
and I was attempting to try and see continuity and explore if the social structures that precede, precede a disaster and seem to influence so greatly a community's ability to cope in its aftermath have themsel in themselves been shaped by earlier flood events that afflicted the same locale and community. So I aim to take one specific flood, um, and this is the flood I've, I've published most on and I kind of know a lot about and keep coming back to. And this is the North Sea Flood of 1953, which was the largest uh, uh, natural catastrophe in the UK in the 20th century. It caused in the range of about 308 to 380 deaths, depending on how you, you want to define the direct causation there. Um, so for this one historic uh, flood, I wanted to zoom into one specific location, um, which was the, the town of Kings Lynn in, in the southeast of England. Um, and I wanted to look at the local churches, how they responded in the immediate aftermath, uh, how they filled in um, with community needs um, and whether they increased social resilience or not. Social resilience being a term commonly used in disaster risk reduction studies. But then I also wanted to see if the role that these religious institutions might have played in commemorating the floods, in embedding the floods within a longer historical narrative of the region. And in exploring this longer process of the cultural inscription and commemoration of a flood into a community, I inadvertently found that by exploring community response, we could gain insight into wider societal trends and other historical narratives. So the interesting thing that kind of popped out of this was the, the flood in 53. There was lots of interesting things the church did in that immediate aftermath. But then when I went to look at the longer commemoration of this flood, the inscribing of it in a kind of local tradition and memory, um, the first kind of thing we see about commemoration starts to appear about 25 years after the flood in 1978. Um, this largely is because there is another flood in 1978. Um, in almost the same neighborhoods and parts of the town. Interestingly, we can see, though, when we're thinking about wider historical trends through that period, the church weren't central in the response in 1978. Um, there's a very sad anecdote reported in some of the newspapers. Um, in 53, the Salvation Army had been central to the response. They'd provided shelter, they'd provided food, they provided clothing. In 78, the Reverend of the Church Records I looked through did the same thing. He did a collection. Uh, and then two weeks after the floods, he had an appeal in the newspaper and there's a forlorn photograph of him with a stack of clothes and shoes because no one came to collect them. Uh, by 78, things have shifted and we can see, so we can see things like uh, secularization occurring in Britain. We can see a trend of, of uh, the rise of the welfare state and the support network that comes with that. Okay, so briefly then, uh, I'd like to consider some potential routes forward. The thing I really wanted to do when I started my thesis um, was to have weather as the central protagonist of the story I was telling. And while it did remain central to my thesis, it was more there more as an interlocutor, a catalyst that brought underlying social ills to the fore or forced new meteorological forecasts and technologies into service. And this is where I think the history of science can be more creative and learn from other disciplines like literary studies and environmental history. As I think this, there was and still is a thesis to be written that categorically puts extreme weather as the agentive force at its centre, whilst also mean, managing to meaningfully integrate the relevant meteorological and hydrographical understandings from the period. So quickly, I just wanted to raise two, two essays I found useful in thinking in this regard. The first here is, is by uh, the social, environmental sociologist William Freudenberg, and it's a, he uses the case study of a mountain um, with its relatively unchanged physical structures to explore the changing social meaning of a mountain over a very long time frame. And the second is an uh, essay by the environmental historian Linda Nash, which actually explores what happens if we try to assert agency for nature. So um, exploring narrative structure and the agentic terminology used across different flood events by different actors can give us insight, but how can we reach that? How can we find that in historical archive, especially if we're thinking about longer time frames? One area I've started to think about, but I've not done as much research yet as I'd hoped, is the phrase, an act of God. This is consistently used across a fairly long time period, over 200 years at least, if not longer, in a British setting. Um, and it helps us to think about um, not just necessarily a progressive narrative of divine providence further in the past, through to the kind of contemporary uh, techno sort of language that would accompany a response to a flood. Um, and some of the things that we might think about and, and ways forward with this, um, this is a fairly new database um, coming out of the Weather Extremes project, um, 
which has collated a vast range of, of weather records from county record offices and other archives across the United Kingdom um, and is now available online. You can search them via a map or, or different keywords. And this is for all types of weather extremes that they've collated from about 15th century onwards is most of their coverage. So a database like this might access this. But then I'm also interested in how we can take this line of reasoning along with, with actual physical uh, things. So um, hunger stones, I don't know whether people are familiar with the concept of a hunger stone found across Central and Western Europe, uh, a, a lot on the River Elbers. This one is here. Um, and this, this, this stone here is one of the most famous. And so these are stones that have been placed at low, low water marks in rivers and other water bodies that when uh, famine occurred, people have put warnings for future generations there. So this central one's one of the most famous and the inscription in the center of it uh, is dated and then it, it reads, uh, if you see me, weep. Um, interestingly though, again about this changing, uh, changing landscape that humans live in, um, these stones are being seen more and more frequently, not just because of changing climatic conditions, but because of changing water and hydrography and land use. So um, there's, there's several power plants along the river that divert water, um, and so they're actually becoming more of a tourist uh, 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 thing. Uh, this is from Atlas Obscura, um, as something you should go and visit. But in the UK, we have something similar. There's thousands of flood markers all over the UK, um, and this uh, is Kings Lynn uh, in, in the chapter I mentioned previously. Um, and it's not very clear because it, it's not clear, but this is 1953. So this is the national catastrophe year of 53. Um, this is 1978 when no one died and there wasn't a national catastrophe. But for the town of Kings Lynn, the water was nearly a foot higher in the church, which is right in the center of the town. Um, OK, quickly, as I, I'm aware of time, what's the point? <laughs> um, so I, I think exploring agency uh, in, in flood events and historical things and the language used to communicate them, whether by elites or whether by popular understandings, can really help us uh, to engage with sort of the reinvigorated environmental activism that we might see around us. This is the Guardian's announcement of their changing style guide uh, to use different terms like climate uh, emergency, climate catastrophe, uh, global heating, uh, extinction rebellion have already come up uh, a couple of times today. And as academics are already starting to respond to this, this is uh, Professor Mike Hume um, at Cambridge, someone who I've worked with before and hugely respect, but he wrote a blog about this and sort of, I, I think that was quite a, a strong reaction to maybe what some of this language would do and perform and how it might be counterproductive. Um, but I think by using, looking at historical cases of how different language has been used and wielded, we might be able to have a more empirical basis to whether we respond or how, how we would work with these kind of groups. Um, and I think about time, so I'll leave it there. Thanks.